Welcome back to Lecture 2 from Chapter 2. This, of course, from the textbook Foundations of Earth Science, the 8th edition, written by Lutkins and Tarbuck. Chapter 2, Rocks, the Materials of the Solid Earth. So we learned about minerals and the different properties of minerals uh, and how we can identify minerals, the silicate minerals, the non-silicate minerals. Now we want to talk about what minerals make up. And minerals make up rocks, your igneous rocks born of fire, your sedimentary rocks born of weathered material, other rocks, and of course your metamorphic rocks, which are essentially baked rocks from other types of rocks. And so that talks about the rock cycle as well, how these rocks form, the type of rocks that form in different environments, and that is going to be chapter two, taking us into our study of earth science. One of the underlying themes of earth science is that earth is a system. It's not just hydrology or the atmosphere or the geosphere or uh, even planetary science. It is all those systems working together. And within each of those systems, there are systems and cycles. And one of the primary cycles, of course, we study in earth science is going to be the rock cycle. And that describes the interactions between components of the earth system, um, the origins of igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks, and then how they are connected, how igneous can become sedimentary, how sedimentary can become metamorphic, how any of them can be melted and turned back into igneous, and then once again, sedimentary through weathering. It's a cycle that rocks move through, and it's continuous. Now, it take, may take millions of years, but it is continuous and has been since the formation of Earth. Any, ro any rock can be transformed into any other type of rock under the right condition. The cycle is a, a circular thing, really no beginning or end, but just from this, uh, the point of academics, we'll give it a starting point, and that starting point is going to be magma. Magma is liquid rock, melted rock. Now, it's called magma when it's under the Earth's surface. Once it comes out on the Earth's surface, whether it's under the, on the seafloor or on land, we call it lava, but it starts as magma. And magma forms from melting in the Earth's crust and the upper mantle. So in the crust and in the upper mantle, the melting of rock creates magma. Less dense magma will rise toward the surface, magma that has those lighter elements, and then more dense magma will fall toward the Earth's center, or move toward the Earth's surface. Once, of course, magma gets to the Earth's surface, it erupts as lava, as I said, or it will cool within the crust, meaning magma that pushes up toward the crust, toward the surface of the Earth, or even the sea floor, will either break to the surface or break to the sea floor and erupt as lava, or it will cool within the crust. And it really makes a big difference in the type of rock that you have, depending on where, what happens. Cooling of magma, cooling of liquid rock into solid rock is known as crystallization. Those minerals that make up the rocks crystallize. They may form perfect crystals, they may form tiny crystals you can't see, they may form big crystals you can't see. It really depends on where they cool, how quickly they cool, but cooling is called crystallization. And of course, igneous rocks crystallize from magma when it's within the crust or lava at the Earth's surface or again on the seafloor is also the Earth's surface. Igneous rocks exposed at the Earth's surface will then undergo weathering. The atmosphere helps decompose rocks. There's lots of mechanical ways in which um, rocks are broken up into smaller material and perhaps sometimes it, it dissolves uh, in water. Loose material that is uh, the, the result of weathering, loose material is called sediment. Sediment is transported by gravity, running water, glaciers, wind, and waves. Most sediment ultimately reaches the ocean, but some is deposited in other environments, lakes, swamps, um, even reservoirs, um, but generally it moves toward the ocean. Once that sediment is deposited, it undergoes lithification, which is simply conversion into rock by either compaction or cementation, and sometimes it's a little bit of both, compacting sediment until it becomes solid, or cementation, just the cementing of loose sediment grains into solid rock. Now, that rock, that sedimentary rock, or the igneous rock that we started with, uh, that, was, uh, that came from lava or from magma, either of those two rocks, if they are deformed or changed by heat and pressure, if and when they're buried deeply into the earth or they're part of the building of a mountain change, a chain that is, a mountain chain, heat and pressure can change rock, literally bake it in some cases or pressurize it. 
And those types of rocks, because there's change, undergo a metamorphism, and they're a metamorphic rock. And then eventually, if you have enough heat, all rock will once again melt and generate more magma. So that's a general conversation about the rock cycle, and this is the way it looks, and this is the type of illustration you may have seen since the fifth grade, but essentially you have igneous rock at the top, whether it's extrusive on the surface or on the seafloor or intrusive under the surface, igneous rock that is weathered and turns into sedimentary rock, and sedimentary rock that is, is then be, uh, buried or pressurized in mountain building and turns into metamorphic rock, but igneous rock can also be buried and pressurized and turned into metamorphic rock, and igneous rock can also be melted close to the mantle and turned into new igneous rock, and of course, sedimentary rock uh, can be melted and turned into igneous, sedimentary rock can be turned into metamorphic, they can all be interchanged and moved from one place to the next. So rocks are not stable, unchanging masses over geologic time. The mountains we see, the rock outcrops that we see, they are not static, they change that. Change may happen over millions and billions of years, but they do change. The different stages of the rock cycle are occurring today just like they were occurring tens of, hundreds of, and even thousands of million years ago. Like new igneous rocks are forming in Colorado, in, uh, in Hawaii that is, in the, uh, the basaltic lava flows of Hawaii. The Colorado Rockies are currently eroding and, those, and that erosion, that sediment's being moved to the Gulf of Mexico where it's being deposited. So eventually new sedimentary rocks are forming. So the rock cycle is ongoing and is occurring today. Rocks, as we've already said, do not always go directly from igneous to sedimentary to metamorphic. Um, igneous rocks can remain deeply buried and then become metamorphized or metamorphosed. So igneous can become metamorphic. Sedimentary and metamorphic rocks can be uplifted and eroded and turned into new sedimentary rocks. It, it's all sort of an intertwined process, but the rock cycle is driven by internal processes and external processes. It's driven by the Earth's internal heat and the external processes of weathering erosion, which are driven by the external processes of sunlight and gravity. Let's start by talking about igneous rocks. Rocks formed by fire. Igneous rocks form when magma or lava cools and crystallizes. Magma is generated most commonly by melting in the mantle, but some is generated by melting in the crust. It rises because it heats up and expands, like all substances heat up and expand, and it rises because it's less dense than its surrounding rock. Magma that reaches the Earth's surface, again, that's known as lava. Solidification of lava at the Earth's surface creates extrusive, meaning it's outside of the, the, the core of the Earth, the inside of the Earth, extrusive, extrusive or volcanic igneous rocks. Most volcanic eruptions actually aren't violent. Um, you have lots and lots of uh, volcanic eruptions in the ocean, whether they're under the seafloor or at the surface, they are very mellow. Um, and those are basaltic eruptions. Then you have um, the, the volcanoes of the Cascades and the Columbia Plateau, all very mild eruptions. Some eruptions, however, as we all know, are quite violent. Different types of magma create different types of volcanic eruptions. Most magma actually never gets to the surface. Most magma actually solidifies beneath the surface as intrusive inside the Earth's surface or plutonic igneous rocks. So you have extrusive and volcanic, that's on the surface, and then intrusive or plutonic within the Earth. Um, and then those rocks are then only ever exposed at the surface if they're uplifted or overlying material is eroded away. Lots of examples of that. Stone Mountain, Half Dome in Yosemite Park, Mount Rushmore, Mount Washington, all examples of granitic rock, intrusive plutonic rock that cooled underground that was then exposed to the surface. So magma contains elements or ions and magma can, contains lots of different elements or ions, but it contains a lot of silicon and oxygen. Those become the two primary components of most crustal rocks. There's lots of others, but those are the two primary. There's also lots of gases in magma, including water vapor and carbon dioxide, some methane as well, and it's all confined by pressure. 
And in some magmas uh, that are cool enough, there's actually some solid crystals as well. So crystallization occurs as those ions that are moving in the magma begin to slow down as they cool and arrange themselves into orderly patterns, all right? It's those orderly patterns that end up becoming the crystals that we talked about when we talked about minerals. So as cooling continues, more of those ions that were mobile slow down as they cool are added to the crystals until all of the liquid becomes solid interlocking crystals. That rate of cooling, whether it cools quickly, in some cases almost instantaneously, or very, very slowly, some of those deep magma chambers may cool over millions of years, that rate of cooling will strongly influence the size of those interlocking crystals. Slow cooling results in not as many, much larger crystals that you can actually see. Think about granite, think about granite countertops. All those crystals have occurred because of slow cooling. More rapid cooling results in a larger number of much smaller crystals, and sometimes, oftentimes really, crystals so small you can't see them with the naked eye. That instantaneous cooling when you have magma injected out of a volcano into a cool environment, it's referred to as quenching, uh, results in very randomly distributed atoms, so you, you have no crystal growth. And so they really aren't minerals. You just get the formation of what's known as volcanic glass. Ash is actually itty bitty teeny tiny shards of volcanic glass. We may think of it as light and feathery and ashy, but it's actually tiny shards of glass. And so you either get slow cooling with large crystals, quick cooling with small crystals, but instantaneous cooling results in quenching or volcanic glass. And volcan volcanic glass is not considered a mineral. Crystallization is also influenced by magma composition and dissolved gases. So what are we saying? The rate of cooling is a big influence on crystallization. Other influences on crystallization are magma composition, chemical composition, and the dissolved gases that exist in the magma. Igneous rocks generally are composed of silicate materials. We talked about silicon and oxygen being a big chunk of what igneous rocks turn into being. Well, silicon and oxygen, that's the main, main elements. Uh, and then you have aluminum and, and calcium and a number of others, iron, magnesium, that make up about 98% of the magma. So silicon, oxygen, and these others make up about 98% of most magmas. You also have some small amounts of trace elements, titanium, manganese, gold, silver, uranium, some of those economically beneficial uh, elements that exist in magma. During crystallization, these elements combine together to form those two major silicate groups and then also the non-silicate group. The dark silicates, as we talked about in chapter one, are rich in iron or magnesium, and they're low in silica. And I mentioned in chapter one that this amount of silica becomes very important to understanding how magmas act, how volcanic eruptions act, and the type of rock that results from the magma. So dark silicates have low silica. Think about the black sand beaches of the big island of Hawaii, where we've had the most recent volcanic eruptions. The black sand beaches, because that, that extrusive volcanic rock that forms, it creates the sand of those beaches, is a dark silicate, and it has a very low silica content. You have your olivines, your pyroxenes, your amphiboles, and your biotite micas. Light silicas, again, contain greater amounts of potassium, sodium, and calcium, and they have significantly greater amounts of silica. Larger amounts of silica are those very complex tetrahedral chains or sheets or three-dimensional tetrahedral, the silicon tetrahedral uh, combinations, and they have, they create the light silicates, lighter colored rocks, but they also create those more violent volcanic eruptions because it's harder for the gases to escape. And those are gonna include your quartzes, your muscovite micas, and all those feldspars. And those feldspars make up about 40% of igneous rocks. And so from left to right, we go from mafic and or basaltic to andesitic and granitic rocks. And the primary constituency here is the amount of silica where the ultramafic and the mafic have a low amount of silica, the andesitic has a medium amount of silica, and the granitic, the lighter colors, 
has a high amount of silica. Now, the second row down, whether coarse grain or fine grain, depends on where the cooling of that magma occurred. You're going to have coarse grain cooling if you have the cooling occurring slowly underground, and the fine grain crystals, the rhyolites, the andesites, and the basalts, if that cooling is happening at the Earth's surface. Again, the volcanoes in Hawaii are producing basaltic lava flows. They are low in silica, and they're occurring at the Earth's surface. Um, as you go from ultramafic to granitic, you add potassium and sodium. As you go from granitic to the left, to basaltic and ultramafic, you begin to add irons and manganese, and, and uh, that's where we get the, the mafic term from the magnesium and from the ethy of, of, of iron. And so those are your darker color rocks. And another very important aspect of this is the melting point. Those high silica rocks, those granites and the rhyolites that have a lot of silicon and the lighter color light silicates, they will melt at a, at a, at a 650 degrees. So they melt at a lower temperature, which means they also solidify at a lower temperature, where it takes much, much hotter magma to melt your ultramafic and your basaltic elements, your basaltic rocks. But it also means that as magma cools, those rocks will solidify first. So as a magma chamber cools underground, your ultramafic and your basaltic rocks will cool first, and then slowly next will come your andesitic and then your granitic rocks. And of course, an interesting aspect of that is those ultramafic and basaltic rocks with all that iron uh, and the magnesium, they're going to be more dense. And so as they, as the magma chamber cools, they form first and they fall to the bottom of the magma chamber, which means the rest of the magma that's going to cool doesn't have those types of elements. And it's, it's why we can get different types of rocks from different volcanoes. On the sliding scale for igneous rocks, rocks formed by fire, melted magma, solidified and crystallized as igneous rocks, whether intrusive or extrusive, whether crystallized underground or at the surface, goes from felsic to mafic and even all the way over to ultramafic. So felsic rocks are those rocks with a great deal of silica, all right? They are igneous rocks of granitic composition, a lot of granite, and they, they are made up almost entirely of these light colored silicates. You've got your quartzes, your potassium, feldspars. Felsic, the word, comes from feldspar and silica. Right? Most contain about 10% dark silicate minerals like biotite, mica, and amphibole, but they're as much as 70% silica, and they are a major constituent of crustal rock. And that 70% silica means they have very complex chains and structures of the silicon tetrahedron in the magma. And that means that gases cannot escape very easily, and it subsequently means that volcanic explosions of felsic rocks are, are very violent. Conversely, basaltic or mafic rocks, they contain at least 45% dark silicate minerals. They, they tend to be dark, they're calcium rich, very little quartz. They get their name from magnesium and ferrum, uh, iron is ferrous, Fe. Um, and they are darker and they're more dense, they're heavier than granitic rocks because of the iron content. They also have less silica. And because they have less silica, there's much simpler chains of silica in the magma, which means gases can escape more easily and the eruptions tend to be uh, much, much milder when you're talking about the basaltic rocks. Andesitic is somewhere in between, right? Falls between granitic and basaltic, a mixture of both light and dark colored minerals at least 25% dark silicate minerals. Um, and you see a lot of andesitic magmas with volcanic activity along the continental margins because in order to get that extra silica in the magma from coming deep in the, in the mantle, essentially you're seeing some partial melting of the mantle and some partial melting, maybe of even some uh, continental crust. Um, and that helps provide a little extra silica. So it takes you from a low silica magma to an intermediate silica magma. Now, Ultramafic, very low silica. It's at the far right end of this, very, very dark. Um, and again, they are very rare at the Earth's surface, but they are a significant constituent of the upper mantle, uh, which is why a lot of our magmas start out ultramafic and then they take on more silica as they come up to the upper mantle 
and the crust. So we've talked about two different types of igneous rocks, those rocks that crystallize underneath the surface, those rocks that crystallize at the surface. At the surface, crystallization is rapid and the texture of the crystals is small. Below, beneath the surface, the crystallization is slow and the texture of the crystals is large. The texture of a rock is described based on its size, shape, and the arrangement of those mineral grains. That's the texture of the rock. The texture can be used to make inferences about the rock's origins. Basically, what I just said, large crystals, slow cooling. Slow cooling is common in magma chambers deep in the crust. Large crystals means you probably had a rock that formed deep within the crust. Fine grain means cool, rapid, cooling at the surface, basically small masses in the upper crust. Individual, crusts, uh, individual crystals, that is, too small to see, typically. Coarse grain texture is solidified at depth while insulated by surrounding rock. So masses of interlocking crystals roughly the same size and large enough to be seen um, by the naked eye. That porphyritic texture is when you have different mineral sizes within the same rock. Small minerals called the ground mass and large crystals called the phenocrysts. It's essentially porphyritic texture with these two different sized crystal sizes means that some of the crystals formed in one situation and maybe grew larger and then other crystals formed in a different situation uh, and then that was the magma that was ejected and cooled. That vascular texture, that those voids left by gas bubbles that remain when lava solidified, those tend to form in the upper zone of a lava flow. All right, so uh, that's the porphyritic there at the top with the ground mass and the phenocrysts. You've got the really small uh, the crystals in the ground mass, something that probably cooled much more quickly, and the phenocryst, larger crystals, probably cooled more slowly uh, at depth. And then there's your, your pumice or your, uh, your vascular texture. So you've got some lava at the surface where gas, where it solidifies before gas bubbles are actually able to escape, and you get all those holes like Swiss cheese. And, and those are the types of rocks that tend to be very, very low density. Some um, even float. Glassy texture, like volcanic glass, develops in rocks cool very rapidly. The ions freeze before they can arrange themselves in orally crystal structures, so there's no crystals, therefore there's no minerals. So the glassy, whether it's uh, the uh, volcanic glass or whether it's uh, even uh, tuft or, or a volcanic ash, is not a mineral. It's a, it's a rock, clearly, but it's, it's a volcanic glass. And then the pyroclastic Fragmental textures composed of individual rock fragments ejected during an explosive volcanic eruption. Um, you, know, you could have angular blocks within the rock pulled out the side of the, the vent. You can have small, fine grain. You can have molten blobs, larger pieces. So that's pyroclastic. It comes from the actual explosion, the actual eruption, and it's pieces of different rocks stuck together. So glassy texture, um, unordered atoms, Again, this is upper left, that volcanic glass, that conchoidal fracture that you can see there. Bottom line is that magma cooled so quickly that the atoms couldn't arrange themselves into, into crystals. The porphyritic texture, two distinct different sized crystals. You've got the ground mass that's gray with the very small crystals probably closer to the surface and then the larger crystals that probably form deeper in uh, that are the, the little white crystallizations. Your coarse grain textures, mineral grains that are large enough to be identified without the microscope, there's your, your classic granite, all right, something that formed uh, deep underground. There's your vascular, uh, your pyroclastic with different shapes and different sizes and some angular shapes in there, and then a very, very fine grain texture, that F, that bottom right, crystals that are too small for the individual mineral to be identified without an actual microscope. And here's yet another table of the classification of igneous rocks. Um, by their mineral composition, textures result from cooling history. So where do they cool? That gives you the, 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 the textures. And the mineral composition is derived from the parent magma and the environment of crystallization. And the coarse grains, you've got your granites and your diorites and your gabbros. So if you look at the first line of rocks, okay, the fine grain are the igneous rocks that cooled at the surface. Basalt like the Hawaiian Islands, and oftentimes basalt is what's found on the seafloor. Rhyolite is, I'm sorry, basalt is a very, very low silica, flows very easily. Rhyolite's a very high silica and it's very explosive. In between is andesite, what you typically see at the surface with the volcanoes and continental margins. Conversely, and because much magma never makes it to the surface, all those coarse grained 
the granite, the diorite, and the gabbro, they're, they are the, the sister to the rocks beneath them. They just cooled uh, more slowly and a, at a deeper level. Here's your granite. Magma solidifies at depth, then it's uplifted and there's erosion and it exposes the granite dome. That rhyolite is extrusive, fine grain, equivalent of granite. So rhyolite is the equivalent of granite, but granite is formed deep in the earth. Rhyolite is formed at the surface. Light colored silicates, pink, buff, light gray, uh, has voids sometimes and fragments of volcanic glass and it's cooled rapidly at the earth's surface. Here's obsidian, natural volcanic glass, typically dark, from some metal ions, meaning the, the actual material is trans, largely transparent, but because of those metallic ions, it looks dark. So you use obsidian or volcanic glass. It's your pumice, very vascular, and again, um, such low density that it actually floats in water. Andesite is a medium gray extrusive igneous rock. Again, that rock that formed at the surface oftentimes um, at continental margins. The Andes Mountains are named for andesitic or andesite rock. Um, it's an intermediate silica content. It's relatively explosive in its volcanoes, um, like Mount St. Helens. And again, you find them along the Pacific Rim. And the diorite is that coarser grain formed slowly, deeper in the earth, equivalent of andesite. Basalt, that forms at the surface. Gabbro forms under the surface. Basalt is the most common type of extrusive igneous rock. Very low silica, comes from the upper mantle, common in volcanic islands, upper layers of oceanic crust. Um, there's big basalt flows in central Oregon and Washington state. The uh, Columbia River Plateau is just a bunch of different basalt flows. And then Gabbro, that's what the same rock, same composition, but it cooled underneath the surface, typically under the surface of the ocean, under the seafloor, and it's coarser grain. It's an equivalent of basalt, not very common at the Earth's surface, um, and a big component of oceanic crust. All right, so, We've already sort of talked about this with the Bowdoin's uh, series and, and the way we've talked about the fact that one volcano can generate different rocks because magmas evolve. Magmas don't stay the same, they evolve over time. So different rock types can be generated by the same melt. Bowen's reaction series describes which minerals solidify at specific temperatures. First to crystallize is olivine, so a very low silica rock, and last to crystallize is quartz at, at a lower temperature, a very high silica rock. So, um, and in between is your amphiboles, your biotites, your muscovites, your potassium felt feldspars. Minerals that form at the same temperature range tend to be associated with the same igneous rock. So once again, there's Bowen's reaction series. 1200 degrees, ultramafic will begin to crystallize. Then as it cools down to 1000, maybe mafic, then down to 850, intermediate. And finally, those felsic rocks, those granitic rocks, will begin to crystallize at a lower temperature. Um, they have a lower crystallization point, but also a lower melting point, which means your quartzes and whatnot are gonna, are gonna melt at lower temperatures as well. Um, and so um, your olivines will, will crystallize, then your pyroxenes and your amphiboles and your potassium feldspars, your micas and your quartz as the magma cools. And this differentiation in, in cooling results in mag, magmatic differentiation, just basically magma that's different at different times Magmatic differentiation is the formation of one or more secondary magmas from a single parent magma. You start with the main magma, and then as things cool and crystallization occurs, you get a secondary or even tertiary or even fourth and fifth magmas. And that allows us to have one, two, three, four different types of igneous rocks. It explains the diversity of igneous rocks, that the magma composition is continually changing. As, crystal for as crystals form, certain elements are selectively removed, resulting in depleted magma. And also crystal setting, the crystals form with those, those mafic rocks and ultramafic rocks, they are heavier crystals, they are denser crystals, they have a, a higher specific gravity, they will settle to the bottom of the chamber and the other magma that finally forms then will not have those with those elements in them. So here's your magma having a mafic composition, nice basaltic flow, it, it's very mellow, it, it flows out almost like water, uh, and then you have some cooling of the magma body because it's up close to the surface and you get crystals of olivine and pyroxene and calcium rich crystals and they form and they're heavier and so they fall to the bottom of the magma chamber sometimes they even stick to the walls and so the remaining melt has got now more silica in it um, because those other low silica minerals have 
have crystallized out. They've come out of the solution. So now the solution has, is a higher percentage of silica. And so your subsequent eruptions are going to be more violent and you're going to have more felsic rocks than from the original magma. That's not all I can say about igneous rocks, but that's all I'm going to say right now about igneous rocks. Right now, what we want to do is talk about sedimentary rocks. And of course, sedimentary rocks are formed from sediment. And sediment is formed when other rocks are weathered, broken down at the surface. So weathering is the transformation of a rock to reach equilibrium with its environment. Now, I didn't say weathering is breaking a rock down the surface. I gave you this explanation about reaching equilibrium. What that means is rocks are formed in certain environments and they're fine, they're stable, they're at equilibrium in those environments. If they're moved to a different environment by uplift or erosion of the material around it, then they're in a new environment. And in that new environment, nature wants to reach equilibrium and weathering is the way it does it. And weathering then effectively becomes the breaking down of rocks at the surface. Two basic types, mechanical and chemical, they both work together. They both work at the same time. Mechanical weathering actually helps by creating more surface area for chemical weathering. And then chemical weathering helps mechanical weathering by weakening the surface of rocks. So they both work together simultaneously. And then once those rocks are broken down at the surface into smaller pieces, erosion moves that weathered rock away and deposits it as sediment. So mechanical and chemical, mechanical is the process of breaking down rocks into smaller pieces. The rocks retain the same physical properties of their original parent rock. And then it actually helps to make chemical weathering occur more easily. So we take this first rock on the left. Each side is four square root units. It's got six sides and so it has 24 square units. We cut that rock in half three ways up, down, and sideways. Now each cube has, uh, each face has one square unit. Each cube has six sides, so six square units. There's eight cubes, and so now we have 48 square units. You can see by weathering that rock into smaller pieces, now there's more surface area for chemical weathering to apply itself to. If you cut them in half again, you've got 64 cubes now, and then each of those has a quarter of a square unit. So now you have 96 square units for chemical weathering to work on. So mechanical weathering actually makes chemical weathering uh, more effective by providing with more surface area to work at. Two basic types of mechanical weathering, we have uh, frost wedging, well, wedging, which includes frost wedging and salt wedging, and then we have what's known as unloading, which we'll get to in a few moments. Frost wedging is the fact that ice expands 9% when it freezes. Water expands, it, it gets bigger when it freezes. Uh, it takes up more room. So you put a water in a glass bottle, you fill it to the very tippy tippy top, you put it in the freezer. When it expands, it's going to increase. When it freezes, it's going to increase by 9% and it's going to crack and break uh, the container. Very similar thing happens with rocks. Water gets into cracks, it freezes, it expands, and it cracks a rock. But not only does it freeze and expand, we, we now research points to the fact that it freezes in these lens shapes that actually causes uh, rocks to be lifted up and moved away and you can see that with the frost wedging on the left upper left and this is the way it looks on a mountain range you can see that all these triangular slopes here these are talus slopes this is where rock up here from frost wedging has broken off in smaller pieces and fallen down and created this apron of smaller rock around it that is weathering and then the sediment and of course if we get rainfall and water moving or wind or maybe even a glacier moves into here it's going to pick up all that broken rock and move it in a, uh, basically downstream and that is your erosional process and eventually deposit it somewhere so we can wedge through the water freezing but we can also wedge through the growth of crystals such as salts so salt water contains salts not just sodium and chloride that we taste as salt but different types of, uh, of elements within the water. When that water evaporates, it evaporates as pure water and leaves those salts behind. In the case of sodium and chloride, sea spray or, or even salty groundwater, when it evaporates in rock crevices and in pore spaces, salt crystals grow and they grow larger and larger over time. They weaken the rock by pushing it apart uh, and they create cracks. And so you get this type of salt wedging occurring typically along rocky coastline, but in arid regions where they're exposed to some salt and salt water as well. 
Unloading that I mentioned in mechanical weathering uh, is, is this process. You can see uh, in the illustration to the left, we've got a deep pluton. So a pluton is an igneous um, emplacement. So that whole pluton used to be a magma chamber. It cooled over millions of years very slowly, creating granite. And it's all happy and fine. And then some uplift occurs. It gets pushed up maybe through mountain building or plate tectonics. And then all the land over it erodes away over time. And now it no longer has that pressure pushing down on it. And without the pressure pushing down on it because the land over it's eroded, the pressure inside the rock pushes up and it causes it to sheet in, in very thin layers and, and break. And then those thin layers kind of fall away. And that's known as sheeting or unloading. And we see that with the granite domes that are exposed here in North America, whether it's out in the Yosemite, in the, in the, in the Sierra, or even uh, places like Mount Washington. And uh, you can see that in Stone Mountain in Georgia as well. All right, another type of mechanical weathering, sometimes referred to as biological weathering, but uh, this is essentially when living things break rocks apart. So plant roots grow into cracks and wedge the rock apart. Burrowing animals expose rock to increased weathering. Um, decaying organisms produce acids, which will contribute to chemical weathering. So biological activity also has a big impact on, on weathering rocks. So chemical weathering is slightly different. Chemical weathering is not mechanically breaking rocks apart. Chemical weathering alters the internal structure of the minerals. It actually chemical reactions changing the rock. So elements can be added or removed. Um, the original rock that's now in this new environment can be transformed in, into a more stable material um, and it makes the outer portions of some rocks um, more susceptible to mechanical weathering. By weakening the outer portions, they're more susceptible to mechanical weathering. So water is probably the most important agent of chemical weathering. Uh, you get oxidation uh, and you get dissolution or dissolving uh, through a carbonic acid. Uh, and you also have something known as hydrolysis, where hydrogen ions replace other elements within uh, the rocks, the igneous rocks or the sedimentary rocks or the metamorphic rocks, and it, it breaks that rock down into a more stable material. So um, oxygen dissolved in water causes oxidation. That's just when you know, oxygen attacks uh, other molecules. Rust is oxidation. Carbon dioxide that is dissolved in water creates a weak carbonic acid when rain falls to the atmosphere, it picks up carbon dioxide, that creates carbonic acid. When rainwater percolates through the soil, it picks up uh, more carbon from decaying animals. That carbonic acid uh, acts to dissolve certain types of rocks. Not all rocks, but certain types of rocks. Uh, feldspars can be broken down into clays. Um, and then what's left in granite, you have granite's got feldspar, mica, and silica in it. The feldspars are broken down to clays, the mica may be broken down into smaller pieces, and the silica is carried away by groundwater. Silica ends up being the sand of our beaches because silica is very hard, of course, is very resistant to weathering, uh, and so it typically doesn't get broken down. Chemical weathering of a silicate rock by carbonic acid, um, again, the feldspar minerals can be broken down into clay, um, and uh, the clay is a more stable material. Weathering takes big rocks and breaks it down into little rocks. Sedimentary rocks form after weathering breaks those rocks down. The weathering breaks the rocks down, gravity and erosional agents move that sediment away. The sediment is deposited in a different environment and then it becomes lithified. And lithification is simply unconsolidated sediment becoming solid rock and it happens through either compaction or cementation. Uh, most sedimentary rock is deposited by solid material settling out in the fluid. So mostly we're talking about sediment being carried down to the ocean, settling on the bottom of the ocean, and eventually becoming sedimentary rock. It makes up about 5% of the Earth's outer 10 miles, but it accounts for about 75% of continental rock outcrops. Um, and it, sedimentary rock is excellent for helping to reconstruct the details of Earth's history because it, it's laid down in layers, contains fossils, you can tell a lot about the environment that it was created in by just looking at the rock. So it's, it's, a, great, um, it's a great history lesson, sedimentary rock. And of course, it's economically important because coal is a sedimentary rock, but almost more importantly, petroleum, natural gas moves through sedimentary rocks. And uh, you can find metals and uh, different types of sedimentary rock can be used for fertilizer or for construction materials. So sedimentary rocks, those rocks that are made from weathered material that's been eroded, transported, deposited, and lithified, come in two groups, detrital and then chemical, or sometimes biochemical 
sedimentary rocks. Detrital, detritus, is essentially pieces, time out pieces. So detrital sedimentary rocks form from solid particles, whether from other rocks, chemical and biochemical, that's when you have things dissolved in solution. So water has got ions in it from, from rocks that have been weathered, and those, those elements, those, those ions, uh, at a different time precipitate out of solution and turn back into rock. So here's detrital, contains a wide variety of mineral and rock fragments. Those are the pieces, mineral and rock fragments. Clays and quartzes are the most common. You classify your detrital sedimentary rock by the size of the particles. So you have coarse, medium, fine, and very fine. Your coarse, if it's gravel, it's going to be called conglomerate. If it's gravel with angular pieces, it's going to be called breccia. Your medium size, so sand size, is going to create sandstone. Some very rare occasions, we don't see much of this, arcos. And then your finer grain sizes are going to create your siltstones. And your very, very fine, like your clades, are going to create your shales and your mudstones. Um, and again, very useful in determining the environment of deposition because it takes faster moving water and a higher energy uh, environment to carry gravel sized pieces downstream than it takes to carry clay sized pieces downstream. So you can tell what type of environment deposited uh, the material just by the, the size of those individual pieces. All right, chemical sedimentary rocks, water carries ions in solution, so it just gets mixed in. And salt, take salt, put it in water, it's going to break down into sodium and chloride. That uh, water moves downstream, and then at a later time, of evaporation allows that salt to to reform. So solid materials precipitate to form chemical sediment. So the ions in solution, that's it's been dissolved into solution, SOL being the, the root word there. Uh, ions have been dissolved into solution, that was the chemical weathering. Um, that water moves downstream, and then those solid materials precipitate out of that solution. Um, so salt is left behind when salt water evaporates. Materials can also be precipitated by organisms. Those are biochemical sediments, like shells and hard parts of sea creatures. They take ions out of uh, the water and they create their shells and their hard parts from it. But also, just naturally, um, limestone can be uh, can form, which is calcium carbonate, you, um, in, in the ocean, and you can get limestone deposits as well. All right, here's a type of sedimentary rock. This is extremely uh, fine grain. This is a biochemical sedimentary rock. Those little creatures on the right, coccolithospores, um, they're little planktons. They create these shells around them to protect them. They live for a couple days. They die. They fall to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and after literally hundreds of millions of years, they stack up in these thick layers. Uh, they become lithified. And that lithified rock gets uplifted. And you get the white cliffs of Dover. Those are chalk cliffs. Um, on the southern England coastline, and that is all solid chalk, which is a, a biochemical sedimentary rock that has been formed by these tiny dead sea creatures. And clearly, it's going to take billions and billions and billions and billions of those sea creatures to make that much rock in just tremendous spans of geologic time. Other types of uh, sedimentary rocks, chemical sedimentary rocks, coquina is when you have a bunch of little tiny Shell fragments in Florida at the beaches, we have those brown rocks. That's the coquina rock. The chalk, as I showed you, a travertine is an inorganic limestone that forms in caves. That's just basically when calcium carbonate precipitates out of water and forms uh, uh, travertine and then a number of others. And also we'll talk about the salt again. The salt, when salt water evaporates and it leaves behind minerals, whether it's salt or gypsum, or talc, those are known as evaporites because they form as water evaporates. Water that has the salts in them, the ions in them, that when that water evaporates, it leaves behind those, those sedimentary rocks. Coal is mostly organic matter, but it also forms through sedimentation. So uh, here's your coquina with those little itty bitty shells. That's unconsolidated sediment by the seashore. If that layer of rock gets buried under many, many, many other layers of rock, compaction and cementation will turn it into a actual rock, which is coquina. And here are some of those other different types of rocks that we just mentioned. Here's salt at the Bonneville Salt Flats. There's the Great Salt Lake, and you can see the, the salt flats out there to the left. Um, 30,000 acres of hard white salt that's nearly two meters thick. Two meters thick over 30,000 acres of salt from the evaporation of a shallow inland lake. And these shallow inland lakes, uh, they don't have water going in and out of them. And so as, as water um, 
drains into them from surrounding mountains. They just become saltier and saltier and saltier. That's how you get the Great Salt Lake. That's how you get the Dead Sea um, in the Middle East. And if those salty lakes evaporate, they're going to leave behind big salt flats like that. Uh, coal is a type of sedimentary rock, it's organic, but uh, you have to have a very unique environment where there's not a lot of oxygen because oxygen is what supports bacteria that decompose living things like plants. So in a swamp, in the mucky bottom part of a swamp, there's not much oxygen. Plants die in a swamp, they fall into that muck, they tend to not decompose, so they get buried and compacted and it starts out as peat. Peat is what you can buy at Home Depot to help your plants grow because it's got a lot of organic material. Well, if peat gets buried and compacted, it begins to turn into more and more pure forms of coal. And the, and the, 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 the lignite and the, um, and the soft black coal, those are literally sedimentary. In order to get that hard black coal at the bottom, it goes one more step to heat and, and pressure. Um, so that's actually a metamorphic rock. So you can see the transition from sedimentary to metamorphic rock. All right, so we mentioned lithification. It is the process by which sediment is transformed into sedimentary rock. It happens either through compaction, just more and more layers on top of the unconsolidated sediment, causes it to compact and squish together, press closer together, and it, it lithifies, it turns into solid rock. Or cementation occurs when water uh, with dissolved ions percolates through those pore spaces and uh, those dissolved ions then precipitate out and they cause those particles to cement together. So lithification or turning unconsolidated sediment into sedimentary rock occurs through compaction or cementation. Sedimentary rocks are always laid down in beds. Typically, they're, originally they're laid down in flatbeds. Um, that's a big characteristic of sedimentary rocks. And, you know, we can have very, very thin, very, very thick. Um, but um, where you see a separation in sedimentary rock, like on a cliff, one type of sedimentary rock for a foot or two, then a different type of sedimentary rock, that, that area between them is called a bedding plane. And those bedding planes show you where one type of sedimentation or deposition stopped and another type ended. Basically, it shows you a change in the environment is how you get different types of, of uh, strata stacked up one on top of the other. You see that very well explained in the Grand Canyon. Almost 400 million, 500 million years of, of sedimentary rock is shown in the Grand Canyon. Fossils are found in sedimentary rock and that helps make them great for uh, helping us to decipher past environments. The fossils that we see, whether it's uh, fossils of living things or just fossils of past environments, you get fossils here of mud uh, cracks and fossils here of, uh, of little of waves, essentially. That, that on the right is where some sand, some very silty sand, was moved by waves and created those little hills. And you, if you're snorkeling in the still water, you might see these types of ripples on the bottom of the uh, ocean. Well. If they get covered by additional sand and silts, eventually they might be compacted, and that's a fossil of those, those original little hills in the bottom, little rills in the bottom of the ocean. All right, so igneous rock, sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock. And metamorphic rock is new rock from old rock. You take old rock and you bake it. You pop it in the oven, right? You either bake it or you bake it and, and pressurize it. Either way, whether it's just from heat or it's from heat and pressure, metamorphic rock is any type of rock, sedimentary, igneous, or metamorphic, that's been heated and pressurized and changed into a new type of rock. Um, it occurs when the parent rock is subjected to different physical or chemical environments, so elevated temperature and pressure, but also you can get some types of very active fluids deep in the Earth's core that, that will help to change rocks. So, Metamorphism is something that doesn't happen in an instant. There's no tipping point where one rock turns into another. It happens incrementally, so heat and pressure build up and the rock slowly changes. And so you have low grade metamorphism with slight changes to a higher grade metamorphism with more significant changes. So um, here are two examples. The parent rock is shale, so shale is going to be clay, clay, mudstone or clay. So, you know, clay in a very still environment settles at the bottom of a of a big lake or the bottom of the ocean, and more clay builds up, and more clay builds up. Eventually, those um, those little fine segments or little pieces of clay are 
are compacted together and it turns into shale, which is a nice little rock. Well, that same shale is pressurized, or really it's just heated, low pressure, low heat will slowly turn into slate. And essentially all you've done is really more tightly packed the minerals together. Um, the other side of that is a more of a granitic rock, that parent rock at the bottom. You can see it's got sort of randomly oriented minerals with high grade metamorphisms, strong compression, strong heat. Those minerals are literally lined up and you can see how they create this foliation, these lines, and you can actually see wavy lines in there. So that's from the deformation of that rock. And so that's a granitic rock turned into nice, or sometimes we say nice is the name of that rock. All right. Metamorphism is going to occur in two different settings. You have contact metamorphism and regional metamorphism. Contact metamorphism is a rock that's subjected to increasing temperatures. Some magma comes into contact with the rock, literally bakes it. Regional metamorphism is more uh, high pressure and high temperature that happens from plate tectonics and during the process of mountain building. So it's, it's a much larger area, it's heated and pressurized, and uh, that's regional metamorphism. So again, heat and confining pressure are the two main agents of metamorphism. Um, heat from some magma, and sometimes heat comes from just that rock being buried deep from, from plate tectonics, uh, chemical reactions and recrystallization of new minerals. So the heat causes a chemical reaction within the rock and the old crystals recrystallize into new minerals. Pressure, basically pressure in all directions, um, squishes the minerals together and that causes them to recrystallize. Now, you can have differential stresses where you have pressure more or so in one direction than the other. That causes rocks to not only be pressurized but to deform. And that gives you those textured metamorphic rocks like we see with the, with the gneiss down here in the bottom right. Not only was it pressure to cause those grains to line up, but it was also deformed. And so that's going to be a differential stress placed on that. And then the last, I mentioned the chemically active fluids. Hot fluids deep in the Earth's surface can cause recrystallization to occur. It can dissolve uh, a mineral in one spot, and allow it to precipitate out in another spot, and literally changes the chemical composition of the surrounding rock. So here's a couple of examples of, um, of metamorphism. Low-grade metamorphism makes rocks compact and more dense. And so in this case, you're looking on the right, you're looking at confining pressure. So it's, it's equal, the top right is equal in all directions. And um, this is in a depositional environment, as confining pressures increase, rocks deform by decreasing in volume. Essentially, they get smaller, they get squished together, right? So it's a big chunk. And now it's a smaller chunk. It's equal pressure in all directions. In the bottom, during mountain building, you get all types of uplift and, and pressing down. You're going to have differential stresses. And the rocks are literally shortened in the direction of maximum stress. And then they lengthen where there's less stress. And so it causes these wavy, uh, uh, wavy striations. It's called foliation in the rock. And here we have our foliation. Before metamorphism in the illustration, our our mineral grains are moving and pointing in every which direction. As pressure comes to bear on that rock, they begin to line up and you begin to get that foliation pattern. So this bottom rock is, has had some decent metamorphism, but it's not seen differential pressures yet. It's not all wavy. So this is foliation, the development of flat, the development of flat arrangement of mineral grains um, or, or structural features from, from pressure. It just gets all pressed into one flat bed. Foliation is a characteristic generally of regional metamorphism. It's driven by those compressional stresses. Um, and you can have parallel alignment of micas or even flattened pebbles. You can have separation of light and dark minerals. So you may see, I'm gonna go back again, where the light minerals line up in one area, the dark minerals line up in a different area. There you can see the same thing. Um, so that foliation really creates some distinctive looks to some of these rocks. They, you, you go from the granite on the left to the sneeze or the schist on the right, and it, it's definitely a distinctive look. So you can get metamorphic rocks that are non-foliated. Uh, basically, if the parent rock is composed of very large, stable minerals, you're not necessarily going to get uh, any type of foliation. So here are your uh, common metamorphic rocks. And again, either slate is where that mudstone or that shale stone has been 
squished down and your, your clays just get nice and lined up. Um, and then, you know, as you progress down from, um, from minimal part, amounts of metamorphism to significant amounts of metamorphism, you can see how those, um, those rocks change from the slate to the phyllite to the schist and the, and the gneiss. Uh, and then if we talk about non-foliated, so you take limestone or dolostone or quartz or sandstone, it, they have very, very stable, if you may recall, I said quartz doesn't break down very easily, um, quartz doesn't weather very easily, it's a very stable mineral, it's just silicon and oxygen. It can take tremendous amounts of pressure and not change, and so instead of quartz changing into foliated rock, it changes into this quartzite. And the same thing with limestone and dolostone, which is very similar, but you know, take, think about limestone. When you put pressure on it, that changes into marble. So marble, quartzite, what we make granite uh, countertops out of, not granite countertops, marble countertops out of, those are metamorphic rocks. There's your, your slates, right? Rooftops, roof shingles, and you can see those flat slate pieces that are sort of out in nature there. And again, that's metamorphic rock. You take shale or mudstone, you pressurize it, and it becomes your slates. Um, and then the non foliated metamorphic rock are your marbles, and you can see they are very popular because they're easy to be carved in marbles and they're great for, for different types of building. So those are going to be your common non-foliated metamorphic rocks. So that was chapter two from the Foundations of Earth Science textbook, the eighth edition from Lutkins and Tarbuck. Of course, chapter two on rocks, the materials of solid earth. We learned about the igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. As we move into chapter three, we're going to begin to talk about landscapes of the solid earth, of the geosphere. That's going to bring into play mass wasting or the movement of material downhill under the force of gravity, and then how landscapes are shaped by that movement, and of course, the force of water. So we'll see you for chapter three, Landscapes Fashioned by Water.